recording. All right, so today is March 28th, 2021, and we have a special Desiderata Extinctionati discussion with uh, our interview with Lear Keith. And uh, hi, Lear, um, do you want to do a small introduction about yourself? And then everyone will start the questions after. Sure. Um, I have been a radical feminist and an environmental activist for 40 years now. I'm 56, <laughs> so I've been at this a long time. Um, I'm the author of a bunch of books, seven books. Um, probably the most famous one is The Vegetarian Myth. And uh, we just had a book come out last two weeks ago that I wrote with Derek Jensen and Max Wilbert, and that's called Bright Green Lies. So we're super pumped about that. And this is my dog, Jamie. You're next to me. And my other dog is outside. So I live in Northern California in the Redwood Forest on the coast of California. So. Okay. So can I ask the first question? Uh, yeah, so yeah, ahead. I just, um, I haven't read Bright uh, Green Lies yet, but I, I read Deep Green Resistance. Um, can you just for the audience just go through what bright green lies about the normal spiel which you're probably getting really sick of by now but not, just at, all. not at all <laughs> and then um and then immediately my first question is must be the next question people ask you is um is about planet of the humans and did mm -hmm. You know, Jeff Gibbs and Michael Moore's thing, or the reaction to it, did it influence it in any way? Because I know you started long before that yeah. was released. Yeah, so the book is about what has happened to the environmental movement and how we are being led astray. Um, it, it was before, you know, from Rachel Carson onward, the environmental movement was about protecting the wild places and wild beings that we loved. They have a right to exist and they are also our kin so we should be protecting them is sort of the basic ethic uh, we can't exist without them either i mean you and i cannot produce oxygen we can't make the rain come um, we can't photosynthesize we can do very little besides consume and i don't mean that in a bad way there's you know in the trophic pyramid you need the top level predators that everybody has a role to play we all evolve together but we can't do any of that other stuff so i don't know what humans are thinking if we get rid of you know, every last tree and every last grassland and we are well on our way to killing off the plankton in the ocean, there will be no oxygen. And I don't really know what people are thinking. Like, how can we live without our planet? So all of that was what went into you know, having a, a vibrant and committed environmental movement. And that got hijacked somewhere along the way. The, those basic values aren't there anymore. Instead, the main goal seems to be, how do we continue to fuel the destruction of our planet. So awareness of the greenhouse gases and global warming, that is a huge emergency and that's quite real. I'm not saying that it's not, but the people who that was their main concern seem to have taken over. And their main goal is not to protect wild beings and wild places. It's to continue to fuel environmental destruction. So like right now what's happening is you have entire biomes. So plants, animals, what, everything is just fed into this giant machine and they're turned into dead commodities. And then those commodities are transformed into private wealth. And if you're an environmentalist, you're supposed to know that doing that to entire biomes was a really bad idea. And our goal was to stop it. And it does mean completely transforming society. I'm not naive about this, but what choice do we have? If you love this planet, you wanna fight for it. And somewhere starting in the 80s, this all changed. So instead of trying to stop that process, they realized, okay, we're wrecking the climate by releasing all this carbon. That's bad, which it is, um, but we need this way of life to continue. So we just need another way to fuel it. So they've come up with all these proposals that involve things like wind and solar and biomass and hydroelectric, and that's supposed to fix the problem. Well, it doesn't fix the problem because first of all, it only continues the destruction. But second of all, I mean, we're really being lied to. None of those technologies scale up to actually fuel an industrial civilization. So it can't be done, which to me is a good thing, but they keep fighting as if this is possible and desirable. And then the third problem is that every one of those so-called alternative um, energy sources are at least as destructive as burning fossil fuel. 
they are at least as destructive. Some of them are dramatically more destructive. So we are just being lied to. And I, I don't really understand the psychology behind any of this. It, it all seems sort of obvious, but indeed there's an, a whole movement of people who, you know, and they're very impassioned. I don't, I don't blame them for caring about this issue. Like, like I said, the climate has been wrecked and we do need to do something, but their solutions are not addressing the actual problem, nor are they solutions that are even going to fix what they think is the problem. So that's why we wrote the book. Um, and so we go through all the different, you know, every single one of these quote alternative technologies, we explain what they are, we explain how they're made, we've got all kinds of facts and figures, you know, why it's not going to work, the destruction involved in doing things like wind or solar, biomass, completely horrifying, all of this is in the book. Um, a few of the other kind of bright green lines that we talk about, the green city, um, energy storage, because you can't do any of this without a whole bunch of batteries and they're lying about that too. It really can't be done. Um, and then we talk about what we think the real solutions are, which starts with reclaiming our movement. So that's pretty much the book. So we started writing this book a long time ago. It was, there's three of us. It's me, Derek Jensen and Max Wilbert a bunch of years ago. I mean, we started thinking about it. It was almost a decade ago. And then other, you know, we write other things, we do other stuff is eventually we're going to have to come back to this book. Um, and then we were almost done. I mean, we were right at the very edge of the, you know, finishing all the, the final edits and stuff. And we heard about this other film that was coming out. It was called Planet of the Humans. And so I, I read a bunch of articles about it and it was, you know, about six months before it came out. And I was amazed because it's like, this is our book. We're not alone. You feel crazy sometimes. Like, how am I the only one that gets that biomass is the destruction of forests. You chop them down and burn them and you call it green. This seems insane, but everybody's going with it. So you do feel a little bit nuts. Like they're pulling a Milgram experiment on us and we're just not in on the joke. Like how is everybody doing this? Well, anyway, so here comes Michael Moore and this guy, Jeff Gibbs, who I'd never heard of, and they're putting out this film. So I read all the articles and was like, this is our book. This is the best news ever because we're not alone. And also they're going to have a reach that, I mean, in our wildest dreams, we couldn't reach with a, with our little book. So it was fantastic. And then the movie came out and I watched it the first day. And I got to tell you, I mean, I, I really didn't, I didn't know Jeff at that point. We're friends now, but I didn't know him. And you get to that point, which is somewhere in like the first third of the movie where he says, it's so beautiful. It's so clear. He says, will the machines of industrial civilization save us from industrial civilization. And I just started screaming. <laughs> like it was like a kid at a rock concert. It was like, that's it. He's got it. That one sentence. He's absolutely, he understands the problem. And it, I thought it was a fantastic movie. So I immediately went over to Derek's house, was like, that's it, afternoon canceled. You're watching this movie with me because this is incredible. And then we reached, we reached out to Jeff because right away he started getting canceled. You know, there was, so much crap that came at him and they got his movie taken off of YouTube and people he thought were his friends, um, you know, tried to, to stop the film, um, which is very painful personally. So, you know, we just reached out to him. It was like, I think your movie's fantastic. You probably don't know who I am. I'm just telling you, you got fans. And he immediately wrote back and he had in fact read our work and was super excited to be in touch. So we've since developed a friendship and we've got some stuff that we're sort of doing in tandem, which is great. So. Um, yeah, I loved the film and I'm very, very excited that, that he, that they got that film out there. I think like 15 million people have watched it. So that's an amazing reach with essentially the same message that these technologies are just as destructive. And why are we trying to continue to fuel the death of our planet? Both of these things just don't make any sense. Do you, do you think it changed the dialogue? Do, do you think the planet of the humans has changed the dialogue? Because I might be imagining it, but I thought that the dialogue did change. You didn't see so many people talking, you know, blindly about solar panels and wind farms being a solution. People are a little bit more introspective. Hard, you know, it's hard to judge without, you know, having like a polling company go in there and actually figure out where, um, you know, if people's ideas have changed. It's, I mean, you could run that experiment, but I don't know that anybody's done it. Um, but I certainly see that as well. I mean, I, I saw it on my own Facebook page, you know, where people who really never thought about it and why would they, it's not, you know, this is not your life. You just sort of, okay, well, all the good people think we can do this with solar and wind. So, 
And I want to hope because without that, I don't know what we're going to do. So I think people have an, an emotional investment in things that, you know, doesn't necessarily pan out, but I get how people end up there. And now along comes this film and they're shown the kind of destruction that goes into these technologies. And then, you know, that bigger question of what are we doing this for? Was, weren't we supposed to be against blowing up mountains and deforesting, you know, huge bioregions? Uh, and it draws people up short, like, oh, I nobody's ever put it that way. I just sort of assumed this was the side of good. And now maybe I'm questioning. Um, and he has certainly gotten a lot of fan mail. I mean, it's it started the, the discussion for sure. So hopefully we can keep pushing because it, it needs to happen. Yeah. Oh, so somebody else better ask a question, but I got loads more. <laughs> You can go ahead here. Yeah, I, I was going to go ahead, Mike. I, I, I've got plenty. Uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm good for now. No, so, I think I'll keep my question for later because we, we'll go a bit deeper into uh, my question is not exactly related to that. So maybe we could stay on the environmental uh, first. Let's go ahead, Mike. Do you have a question, Mike? Or? Oh, uh, not not at the moment. Okay, so, go ahead, so yeah, so so I just wanted to share something um, personal with you, Leah, because you're the you know epiphany with the uh, planet of the humans. I really had that with you with the the veganism and stuff. Because mm. that I you know I'm the same age as you, and I did exactly the same journey <laughs> you did with the vegan stuff. And awesome. veganism is my least least favorite subject because you know it's turned into a religion yeah but yeah I um yeah I I, I started for uh, ethical slash religious reasons to be mm -hmm. vegetarian in South Africa and it in those days it was an affront to just say you were vegetarian and basically say it was for ethical reasons Pe you know people would bang the table and leave the room <laughs> it was like it was like it's you know meat eating country like Argentina and so uh, I eventually got to say oh, it's for medical reasons or something, but I was a vegetarian for about seven years and the same thing happened to me as happened to you. Is you can gradually feel you know, yeah. your health and your body telling you, you do need meat. You can't just do supplements. You need things like choline and stuff. Yeah. And so eventually I did what you know, vegetarians who turn back to meat too. You go on a kind of a rumspringer, start eating all this, you know, meat and very Italian that tastes so good and stuff. Um, but then everybody caught up and became vegetarian. And I told them you won't be able to do it for long. No. Nope. I have one uh, friend who I interviewed who's, who's a well-known uh, anarchist and very militant vegetarian. And uh, he's in his 70s um, and he's not in good health mm -hmm. and he insists that he is, that there's no problem with vegetarian, but you can see he needs meat. He, there, there's a, he's an author and there's another famous author, I won't, I won't mention his name, but an English author that anybody would know if I mentioned it. And they used to share an apartment together and they were they're the exact same age. His friend is not a vegetarian and it, look, you know, he seems about 10 years younger. Yeah, and you know, I, every time he brings up the fact that he's saying, "Well, you know, I can't," uh, yeah, you know, I'm, there are no health uh, risks or or any uh, any health uh, detriments that you get from you know being vegetarian. And I'm just saying, like, look at yourself; <laughs> you, yeah. you're not in great shape you for your age. Um, yeah. And then you know, people come in about they're about six; they've been you know vegetarian for about six months. And they start arguing with you and I say, look, I've, I've done this whole journey, you'll find out later. Yeah, I've already run the experiment, yeah. I, I wondered if you heard of, uh, the stuff that really interested me about what you were saying about, you know, herbivores and how, how they're supposed to live. And I also found all that out. Have, have you heard of, um, I think it's Brian Savory, of the Savory Institute? Alan, Alan Savory, yeah. Alan Savory, that's right, Fantastic. not Brian. Yeah, yeah it's, he's our yeah. hope. If yeah. anything is going to stop global warming, it's Alan Savory. And, yeah. Well, so uh, do you want to just uh, talk about <laughs> Alan Savory and what he's yeah. uh, So Alan Savory, um, just really briefly, he's from Zimbabwe. He grew up, so that's where he grew up. It's, that's the place that he loves the most. Um, and he um, 
oh, I don't know how much of his story to get into. Anyway, he noticed over decades that the landscape where he where he was in Southern Africa had, was just degrading and that the more they applied the quote correct rules, the worse it got. And at that point, what everybody thought was, well, if, if a brittle environment is degrading, it's because there's too many, too many animals, too many ruminants, and they're they're degrading it because they're it's they're on overshoot. And so the theory was, well, you have to get the animals off. So, you know, horrible things were done to giant herds of animals because everybody thought that was the right thing to do. And there are still people who argue that that's the right thing to do. But every time they did it, the situation got worse. So he was um, horrified, um, in total despair. Like, how am I going to save this land? And you can look around the globe and see the same problem everywhere. So this is this is huge. It's not just localized. Um, and he spent many, many years trying to figure this out. And what he came to understand, which is fairly simple, is that the, we all evolved in a community. And that means that not just our bodies, but our behaviors um, affect the health of the land. So, I mean, there's nothing in nature that isn't completely interdependent with every other thing. Um, but it means that we, as a community, there's certain things that we demand of each other and need from each other. And what this means for ruminants is that the force of the, that the predators put on ruminants is that it keeps the ruminant herd tightly bunched and quickly moving. And when there's no predators to do that, the animals don't behave properly because none of us are who we should be without the rest of the community. And that's actually kind of a profound thing to come to understand. So there's another very famous um, kind of experiment with this that happened here in the United States. We have a, a giant national park, this Yellowstone Park, and there are no wolves. They had eradicated the wolves, you know, almost a hundred years ago. And what this meant was that year after year, and in that case, it's not so much ruminants, but browsers. So you have deer and elk, um, and they, there's nobody to correct their behavior. So they stand around on the riverbanks eating the juiciest, yummiest little shoots, which is the saplings. So it's baby trees that need to replace the older trees. They ate it all. And then they ate all the new growth, and all the shrubs and all the bushes and, and the trees. So all you have is old trees, nothing new and no underbrush at all. And there's all these animals that depend on that brush to that's where they live. It's literally where they live. So ground dwelling birds and small mammals, they all need the cover of that, the understory of that forest. And it's not there because the deer ate it all. And why did the deer eat it all? Because it's what they prefer and there's nobody to stop them. So they introduced wolves back to Yellowstone and you there's videos about this. You can watch on YouTube and whatnot. I'm gonna let my other dog out, hang on one second. Go ahead, go outside and bark, go ahead. There's probably a bear walking by and they've got to go talk to it. Um, so they introduced the wolves and within not even a year, um, the all the riparian areas started to repair naturally. So all the, the corridors, the river corridors where the, um, the deer were destroying everything, it stopped. And the reason that the ecologists call this, um, they created an, an ecology of fear, which doesn't sound like a nice thing, but it's true. So applying the pressure from the wolves meant that the the deer had to stay close together and move. And what that meant was, yeah, you can browse some, you can graze some, but you need to move on. And in that process, it means that all of that understory can repair. And now of course, there's all kinds of young saplings there and there's the whole shrubby understory and all these birds came back and the, the rivers repaired, which means there's fish again, there's all the, the life of those rivers has come back and it's all because they introduced the wolves. So it's the same thing on a prairie. So, you know, Alan Savory's thing is the grasslands because he's from Southern Africa and that's mostly what there is there. Um, and this is true in the United States as well. We have a huge chunk of the continent here in North America that should be a grassland and it's not. It was taken by the agriculturalists, by the farmers starting in about 1850 uh, and just mile upon mile has been utterly devastated. Um, and what is there now, instead of this, this, this dense life of prairie, what you have instead is just, I mean, I've driven across this country and it's astounding. It's mile after mile of one plant. So it's wheat or corn or soy, and that's it. And you just drive through it and it's all you see for days. <laughs> and what used to be there, um, 30 to 40 million pronghorn antelope, uh, 10 million elk, 10 million mule deer, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 million uh, mountain sheep, 
and of course 60 million bison. And the estimates are they were probably 5 billion prairie dogs. It's all gone. It's just gone. It's all been removed. And the topsoil was 12 feet deep in places when the Europeans first got there, and it can now only be measured in inches. So all of that abundance and all of that soil was turned into humans. It's us. <laughs> so we did this. Um, and those, I mean, they just have nowhere to go. So they're, you know, on the verge of extinction. There's only 1,200 real bison left in the entire country. And there's uh, there's a, a group of them that live at, near Yellowstone. Um, and that's it. So this is the thing. You have to understand how a grassland works as a community. There's three the keystone species that make the whole thing happen. So you have grasses, you have the ruminant, which were the bison, and then you have the bacteria. So grasses are cellulose, and the 98% of all plants are, are made of cellulose. There's a couple other things they make too, like seeds, but mostly it's cellulose. That's what their bodies are made out of. And humans can't digest that. And there's a lot of animals that have no mechanism to digest cellulose. The creatures that can digest it are bacteria. So whether the plant like right now, there wouldn't be any bison to graze it. So you might have some native grasses here and there, but there's no way to digest that cellulose. So what happens is you're left with mechanical weathering. So rain, you know, just anything will eventually break it down, but there's no one to actually do that work quickly. So what happens is that the grasses will pile up around the, the root node of the plant, like where it comes out of the ground will be covered and that kills it. So in these areas where you still have some perennial grasses, but no ruminants, it's just ever increasing desert because the bare spaces between the plants just grows and grows and grows. And eventually it's just gonna keep decaying until there's there's no life left. Um, what ruminants do is, there's, there's, there's two things. One is that um, grasses evolved to grow from the basal point. So the, where it comes out of the ground, that's where the growth is. That's very different than other plants. So right now I'm looking outside, I'm in the redwood forest and the tips of every branch is a brighter green. And that's the new growth for the year. And that's how most plants grow. They grow from the ends out. Grasses are totally different. They grow from the bottom up. And the action of a, a ruminant, like a bison eating the grass, um, doesn't kill it, first of all. If the growth plant was at, point was at the top, that would kill the plant. They wouldn't be able to grow. But it's not. It's down here at the bottom. So that action of biting it off um, it doesn't kill it, and in fact, it stimulates it um, to the point where there's actually compounds in ruminant saliva that help grasses regenerate. So you can see they evolve together. Um, without the ruminants doing that with the grasses, the, we wouldn't have prairies. And the reason that we have grasslands and not forests is because there's not enough rain. So anywhere where there's enough water, you're going to have trees. But there are huge swaths of the planet, I mean, way bigger than forests, are, are the, the the, the amount of acreage that is grasslands is just dramatically larger. And it's because there's, there's not enough rainfall. So the other thing that grasses do really well is they survive these hot, dry summers. And they do that because they have a really extensive root system under the ground. So what we see on the surface of the ground is not really where the action is. It's beneath the surface and it's just teeming with bacteria and with life. And so the, the roots of the perennial plants are very, very deep. And that's because perennial grasses live a long time. Like trees, they live many, many, many years. So an annual plant is one that only lives a few seasons, so one year. But anything that's a perennial lives many years. That's what perennial means. And because they have all that time, they can make these really extensive root systems. And those root systems do a few things that are absolutely crucial to life. And one is the, the deepness of the roots. They can penetrate way down and that makes a channel. It's a physical way that rain can enter the soil. Without those roots, the rain can't get in. And if you drive by a field that is an agricultural field or even a garden, you'll see that, that when it rains, the water just pools on the surface. It doesn't go anywhere. But if you walk through a grassy area, you won't have big puddles. And that's because the water can actually be absorbed. And this is important because there's months on end where there's no rain. So all the moisture is underneath the ground and it's the grasses that keep it there, that bring it in and then keep it there. And then over the course of the summer, when there's no water for the rest of life, the grasses are slowly using it. It's like this giant sponge and they slowly use it as they need it. And then all the other animals that live above the ground 
have something to eat that has some moisture in it. So a lot of those animals don't really have a, an impulse for thirst. Like they don't drink very much water because there isn't any where they live, but they can get enough out of grasses and whatever else is growing there that they don't need to drink. And that keeps them alive. Um, and the other thing that perennial roots do because they're so deep, they can actually break up rock. So they go down to the bedrock beneath the soil and there's action between the roots of the plants and the, the actual bacteria that create the acids that will erode rock. But what it means is they get minerals and they bring them back up into their bodies. And that's what makes minerals available to like every other living creature, essentially. We cannot eat rock. We can't access it without, you know, huge tools. We also can't eat it. Like nobody here has eaten a rock. We know that we can't eat it, but plants can. And that's how they replenish the minerals. So another problem with growing annual crops is that they call it mining the soil. Like they're literally mining the soil because they're taking the minerals out that they need, but they have no way to replace it. Only perennial plants with those deep roots can do that. So here you have the grasses. So they do all this incredible stuff. They make the rain come in, they make minerals available, they hold the soil in place, just physically they are the matrix that holds soil in place and they build soil every single year. Um, that's what soil is, is like, that's what plants do. So every year there's more soil in these areas, but without the action of ruminants, you don't have a grassland, you've got a desert. Um, because somebody during those long dry seasons of summer and you know into the fall before the rains come, somebody has to degrade that cellulose. And the creatures that do that are called ruminants. So what happens inside a cow or a bison and this is really fascinating. It, it looks to us like the bison is eating the grass because it's biting it and chewing it, swallowing it, but that's not actually what's happening. They're feeding that grass, that cellulose, to the bacteria that live inside their rumen. So again, this is what evolution does. It makes communities. And the deal was the bison said, okay, bacteria, it's gonna be hot and dry all summer. You're not gonna be able to survive out here. You come live in me, we've got a deal. So the bison have this, this called a rumen, it's the big stomach, the fourth stomach, four stomach, four chambered stomach, and it's very neutral pH, very different than ours. Ours are quite acid. Theirs are neutral because it's a home to these bacteria. That's what they live in. They can't live in an acidic environment. So the rumen carries them around, keeps them safe and feeds them this grass. And the bacteria in exchange digest the grass. And what that ruminant is actually eating is the high protein, high fat bodies of bacteria. So it's a great exchange for the ruminant because they get fed um, and it's a good deal for the bacteria because they couldn't live anywhere else. And what this means for the grasses is, well, here's somebody who will stimulate the growth of the plants and, and every time they're eaten, they put down more roots. So it really does make them stronger. Um, but also you've got mobile fertilizing and watering units because of course out the other end comes the urine and the feces which are necessary to fertilize the grassland. So all three of these creatures are working together. Um, if you take one of them out, you it will just degrade to desert. So you need the grasses, clearly. You have to have the ruminants, they have to be grazed. You can't have a grassland without something to eat the grass. And then you've got the bacteria who are actually doing the digestion for it. Um, but again, if you just leave them on their own, they will not behave properly. Just like cows, bison will just stand there and eat and they'll eat what they like the best. Um, and then they'll eat everything else and you know they'll barely move their heads and they'll just keep going until you know it's just completely degraded. Now you add a wolf, you add a human, you add a, you know an apex predator, keep them moving and that's what keeps them moving. So then they're tightly bunched and quickly moving. Alan Savory figured all of this out from observing mostly. He loved that place and he really desperately wanted to find out how do we save it because it's going down. And that was what he figured out. So all around the world now, people are using his methods. Um, I mean, there's millions of acres now that are people who are you know, uh, trained by Alan Savory and his institute to do exactly this with whatever ruminant they've got. Um, and their results are extraordinary. There's places here in the United States you can go. A lot of them are demonstration sites because they want people to understand this. So you can go and look. Uh, you can also see pictures online. There's wonderful videos and photographs before and after, um, you know, having how degraded the area was. And then 10 years later, using these methods, it's just in just you cannot even imagine how much better it looks. It's just absolutely lush with grass 
animals, all of this. His center in Zimbabwe, um, there are more elephants on the land that, that they have under human management than like literally right next door is the national park. And it looks horrible. I mean, it's just, you can see the desert just creeping in every single day. They have more elephants now on the, the Alan Saverly uh, demonstration site than they do in the, the national grasslands. So it works. And of course this is controversial because people, there's so many, there's so much political opposition to these ideas for reasons that are just ideological. It, it seems to me that we should all be recognizing what bad shape this planet is in and anything that might help is worth investigating. And I just think it's so clear that, that his stuff works. And I've tried it a little bit myself and you can totally see the difference pretty immediately. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, on some level it, you just have to move on. Like this stuff works. How do we get more people to do it? So um, in, in the United States, there's a, the grassland farmers association and they do, there's all kinds of organizations that, go to the Midwest and, and help train farmers who aren't a lot of despair. I mean, if you are trying to grow something like wheat or corn or soy, you're utterly dependent on the United States government on the farm bill every year, they get huge subsidies. And the reason they need subsidies is because there's six corporations that control the food supply around the globe, which means they have a monopoly. So they can command prices that are below the cost of production. So there's no way these farmers can stay in business. But then every year the government steps in and makes up the difference essentially. So you get a payout from the government because they get that we kind of need farmers. Um, but it's very politicized, of course. And it, it means that these farmers are essentially serfs to those giant corporations that no matter how hard you work, you can't earn a living. And it's very desperate. And the number one cause of death for farmers the world over. And this doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're in a rich country like the United States or a poorer country like India, the number one cause of death is suicide because they're just driven to utter despair about their situation and that's why. So it's you know absolutely wretched, but when you can show farmers a better way to do it, a way that even the first year you can probably make a good income, um, you know, farmers are down to earth people. They're convinced by results. So when the other farmers, I'm thinking here of Gabe Brown, who's from North Dakota and has been doing this for oh, over a decade. And he's had demonstration sites on his property and he has had, you know, people come and measure carbon content and all of this. And he's a fabulous public speaker. And when somebody like that goes out into, you know, the, the kind of the farm ecosystem and talks to other farmers, he can speak to them because he's one of them. And, you know, they're able to train others. Like this is a way out. You can repair your land, you can make a good living. Um, everything that you care about will be restored if you can just follow these principles and and they do it. So, I mean, it's having great success. It could be better, like if the major institutions could get behind this and understand it, like if the government was actually subsidizing the right things instead of the wrong things, um, we'd be a lot further along. But there's plenty of people out there who are really, it's really my only hope. I mean, I think that it's, it's, it has to happen and there are at least people trying. So, but when you come back to the, the, the uh, greenhouse gas problem, the, the carbon, um, this is how, this is the only way that we're gonna get that carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, what ruminants and grasses do is they, they store carbon, they build soil and they can do it at an extraordinary rate. So some of the figures are that if we had even 75% of the world's trashed out grasslands, which they've been trashed by agriculture. So if we could restore them to actual perennial polycultures, to actual, to being actual grasslands that they should be, it would only take maybe 12 years and we could sequester all of the carbon that's been released since the beginning of the industrial age. And that's extraordinary, but when you look into the research, it, they really can build soil that quickly. Um, we don't need Elon Musk and some bizarre technology that might in fact destroy everything to come along and, you know, put aerosols up into the atmosphere and send the sunlight back and like these giant machines that are somehow going to suck the carbon out and then where are you going to put it? And they don't really know. We're going to store it underground somehow. What if it really, what, what if it cracks and it gets released again? Like these are like insane science fiction ideas. Like, there are people who think, oh, we could we could propel the earth a few more feet away from the sun and that'll solve the problem. Like, are you insane? You actually wanna strap rockets to the earth and try to move us a foot away from the sun. What could possibly go wrong? Um, all wrong, we have yeah. to do 
Just let the grasses and the ruminants come home and they will fix this. So, so you led right into something which I wanted to ask you, and I don't want to really destroy your hope, but I, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about this. The, um, uh, by the way, uh, I got some bad news for you on another score because uh, the three of you, Max, Derek, and you have got to get on to write the next book straight away, and that's against okay. geoengineering because it's it's starting. It's There's terrible. so many indications that these guys are gearing up. Um, oh, no. And one of the things that concerns me most is uh, in uh, in Canada, there's this thing called the Pacific Carbon Feedback uh, Group, um, and they just uh, yeah, they quite advanced into experimentation, and they had um, a video up where they're discussing. Uh, all these things, basically discussing in earnest, now we're going to start scaling these things up with with the backing of the Canadian government. So, so you can see them getting into high gear. But what I found was amazing is in all their papers and research, they, they refer to it as targeted geoengineering. And in this video, while they're discussing it, they're saying, well, you know, we have to call it land management or eco-restoration or climate mitigation. And they're discussing all the code words to use other than geoengineering because it's <laughs> really popular. Yeah. But yeah. one of the things that really concerned me about what this PCF uh, group was talking about was they had, I mean, we're talking a very broad group. There are hundreds of scientists in, involved. It's a, bit, it's a big initiative. And one of the guys came and... Um, well, I actually, he gave a presentation on the the Pleistocene, Pleistocene Park, you know, the Pleistocene yeah. Park. In South yeah. and so so <clears throat> he dismissed it. And he uh, basically, they were all giving these presentations, really building the argument for, we got to start geoengineering, guys, oh. doing all these crazy things. And the, he shot down Pleistocene Park, saying that what the, the data showed them is that the doubling period is about seven years for the, the herd. Mm -hmm. So they're saying the herd cannot mitigate climate change, even though it's exponential growth. It would take like 40 years or something. And so it, it's, although it does work on paper, it's just too long compared to how fast uh, the concentration of carbon is going up. So they dismissed the whole thing, the Alan Savory thing, and I don't, they didn't mention Alan Savory, but they mentioned Pleistocene Park, which is the same thing, and also the buffalo on the prairie. But uh, they have concluded that, you know, we, we're in, in geoengineering territory, and they're doing it without public consent. They're going ahead knowing that the, pu the public will never agree to it. So, and we, we're talking about much worse than solar radiation management and, and, and Scopex and things like that. One of the, the thing, one of the reasons they're doing this is because uh, they, the IPCC made a mistake in all their models <clears throat> for the Arctic and the tundra melt. They assumed as the melt happens, then uh, you get plant growth coming up uh, mm -hmm. as the permafrost melts. Right. What they've discovered recently is the permacast it gets replaced by permacast, which is basically concrete and has way l lower albedo. Right. So it's it's in a runaway feedback loop. And yeah. This carbon feedback loop is they terrified. They're so yeah. terrified they're not even talking to the public about no, it. They're just yeah. going ahead with geoengineering. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, hang on. Sorry, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Oops, sorry, uh, I had to pick the dog out. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to the bears. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so so uh, I think that, you know, Bright Green Lies is already, um, you know, passe. It needs the next thing, which is to mm. stop them going one step further than uh, all the solar panels and, you know, green transition and all that fairy tale. I mean, energy transition and, and that fairy tale. Um, but it's genuinely alarming. Um, and the particular thing I wanted to know from you is a bit, do you agree about this doubling rate of seven years and how, it, you know, it would take, if, it, if you have a doubling rate of seven years, it's, um, it, well, it'll take about 40 years, I think was the, 
the, what their thoughts um, before. Um, we can I, yeah, them. I'd be super curious to, I mean, if you want to send me that link, I'd love to look it over. Yeah, I don't I'll know see. why they think it would take seven years. I mean, it, a cow can have a baby every year. The bison take a little longer, but not that much longer. And I, so it just seems to me that that, why only, um, it doesn't make any sense to me. It, it doesn't to me either, but I, if for some reason, I don't think it's as simple as the gestation period of, of mm -hmm. the herbivore. I think it needs, um, you know, parallel, you know, you've got to build up the whole ecosystem. Uh, the rewilding is a very simplistic thing, which, you know, people talk about pines and lines and, you know, the forestry service backs all these eco restoration because they're not really restoring forests. They're just planting lines of trees, which are basically right. just firewood ready to go up right. in, um, in a wildfire. Um, but listening. they're killing the public very successfully with, I'm listening. Go ahead. They're conning the public very successfully with, you know, kind of even Trump was like a trillion tree. Right. <laughs> and, stuff. and it's like, yeah, sure, because basically the forestry service in America is a branch of the agricultural department. Yes, right. Like the forests are considered to be like maize, you know, they're not, it's an agricultural product. And, you know, they're thinking in terms of, well, we can build houses. This is awesome. Yeah. The lumber industry is getting excited. But Ecologists will tell you, no, you can't, you have to have the mosses, you have to have all the habitat building up alongside it. So I, I, I wonder, I think it works in prairie land like Alan Savory, if you're in, in the felt in, in Southern Africa, uh, but there's, there's not such a complex ecosystem of, in, in that, uh, in Southern Africa. I think it's more complex on the tundra. So they can't build it up so fast. You can't just, um, you know, they, they eat lichen and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. They have to, um, they have to migrate. And I don't think it is the same as Alan Savory. I think Alan Savory just packs, you know, uh, right. packs cattle in. But uh, you see, um, I think there's also something that they, they're restoring the tundra back to a time, you know, the, the Pleistocene. But that's further back in geological time than Alan Savory. So, uh, sorry, I'm getting long-winded here. No, it's fascinating. The, it's, yeah. I, I lived through this story with Alan Savory because uh, I grew up in, in South Africa. And so uh, what happened in South Africa is uh, Europeans arrived. They, you know, enclosed all the land, put up fences, had game farms. It wasn't, uh, they didn't have such a requirement for farming, but they, they fenced off all the game farms because then they, they had their own private game, and that was that was all very nice. But the land started to degrade, and they shot all of it, <laughs> naturally. Uh, the land started to degrade, and by the 80s, they realized they made a mistake because the, the, the game couldn't migrate. So they started programs with the first thing down the path towards what Alan Sober was doing was they took away all the fences right. and let the, the herds migrate across the land. They, that was a big mind step for them because mm -hmm. they thought of the uh, as their personal game, their capitalists. Yeah. And so to let their personal property wander around everybody yeah. else's farm <laughs> was a huge revolution yeah. for, the, for the mindset. So that was the first thing. Then uh, the next stage was, you know, um, Alan Savory's one where you need to really pack uh, animals onto again. I, I went to one game farm about uh, 2014, actually. And I was standing in, in one place looking over this valley and it I, uh, it was very sparse, you know, just a few bit, uh, trees, you know, um, uh, camel thorn and stuff. And one or two antelope around the place. And uh, they had a photograph of at the turn of the century in like 1902. And that same valley was covered like a sea in Impala. And the guys that took the photograph said that 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 when they arrived there, they, they had they were actually trekking and they had to stop and make camp to wait for all these antelope to pass. It took right. three days. Yep. And now they're like, you know, There's look nothing. at the binoculars, you can find three antelope. So they started to realize that, you know, you've got to pack pack them in like that because, you know, half of the ecosystem is like you say, it's in the herbivore's stomach. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's half half the the ecosystem and so um but yeah i just say one more thing and then i'll let you talk but the the 
the thing that frustrates me, even about Alan Savory, is, is they came all the way full circle from like finding these virgin, you know, uh, landscapes, enclosing, you know, hunting them to exhaustion, enclosing them, then finding out the value of migration, finding out the value of restoring all the, the herbivores. But Alan Savory is still with cattle. There's just one step to go right. and you say, instead of cattle, put the impala back. <laughs> and then and then I think you get to why people are have a lot of psychological resistance. Because what it's saying is humans place in all of this is not what we want it to be. It's exactly as you say, we really are hunter gatherers, we're supposed to drive the herds along. And people want to have farms, they want to have settlements. And so, you know, even Alan Savory can't make the final step saying like, guys, we screwed it up. It's <laughs> our place is actually yeah. like like the, the San people that we all yeah. came and, you know, uh, you know, this, the, the South African European story was when we came to Africa, they didn't even have the wheel. Like, you know, they, they didn't need it. We built the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now everybody's getting back to like, oh, no, they were the guys who actually knew smarter than got them. it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and people can't accept that to, you know, there's so much deep seated prejudice against uh, some people like the sun, sun people. But what do you think about all that? I think you're right. Um, I would rather have bison than cows on this continent. That's who belongs here. Um, but I think cows can play a role. And what I also think is that we are in an absolute emergency. So if it means we have to do cows for a few generations just to get this going, I'm fine with that. And in 50 years or 100 years, we can talk about more bison and fewer cows. But right now, we just need the ruminants and we need the grasses because we need that soil because we've got to get the carbon out of the air. And if that's what it takes to kick it off, I'm all for it. So however it happens, okay. let's just get it moving. And it's true. There will be people after Alan Savory who get that sort of final piece. I mean, you've described it so beautifully. That's exactly it. And I consider myself one of those people too, but it's fine. Like we can do it with cows right now. We can have that fight later when the planet is not under uh, as much assault as it is, as it is right now. So it's, let's deal with the primary emergency, but let's keep pushing this idea too, because we do have to understand that this way of life cannot continue. And even the best cows in the world aren't, aren't going to save this if uh, we don't understand that civilization was a mistake. Yeah. It was. Even it Jared Diamond is. says agriculture was yeah. one of the human's biggest mistakes. Oh, it is. Yeah, it absolutely was. And that's just was so groundbreaking to me to read that just that one sentence. I was like, yes, somebody got it. Oh my goodness. That's what I need to hear. And it, it's just, it's burned into your brain. Cause it's like the moment that the pattern falls into place. Yeah. Just, we, yeah. We're stuck. We're stuck yeah. now. We're stuck, we're stuck <laughs> now. Well, we don't have to be. We don't have to remain here. But so some yeah. of us have to provide that longer range vision, you know, of, of uh, well, really I, where I, we're yeah. headed because it's not here. It's really one more. We got to go one more. But yeah, I, I exactly. still think we can get there. But uh, I, I mean, in line with um, you know, bright green lines is uh, there's also ecological lies, and one of the, I think, um, the in the eco restoration crowd and the ecologists they've also made the mistake of um of you know like planet of the humans they were saying that you know so many of these ngos and gibbons and guys like that they've, they've sold out and made the devil's bargain saying look we 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 have these psych you know psychopathic capitalists the only thing they value is money so what we can do is we can say that all the wilderness and uh you know the serengeti has economic value, then they will value it. And I'm saying you, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. Because, no, because you know, it's it, it, exactly now, I've, I've been saying for a long time, if you do that, markets collapse, and they collapse to zero. And so all capitalist markets collapse. Mm -hmm. I mean, capitalists, you look, capitalism eats up everything it touches. So you don't want to make an economic resource and get its uh, economic value as it's worth. The Serengeti is, is not uh, accountable in that way. You can't do that kind of market accounting. And what happened now with COVID is now the tourists aren't there. So as a resource, they've just, all the ecologists now are crying on Mongo Bay and bawling their eyes out saying, COVID has been an e you know, ecological disaster. Why? Because these conservation projects have gone downhill. They've got, they're not funded because they're no tourists. And saying, well, that's what happens if you get involved with capitalism, is you, at some stage, you turn the Serengeti 
into a market value of zero. And then it only has its resource value, which is bushmeat. So what's been happening now with COVID is they've turned the Serengeti into bushmeat. So they are the kind of Gibbons guys that have made this devil's bargain. And it's the hugest mistake known to man. If, if you know, I think we, we need to raise the message on that. No, you're absolutely right. I remember even in the 80s when all of these projects, you know, people were talking about, oh, we're going to have ecotourism in Costa Rica. We're going to have ecotourism in here. And it's like my hair, it's like my hair was on fire. Like, how does this happen? Like, it's not valuable because it's worth money to somebody. It's valuable because it's alive and it's part of the, the earth. And so are we. And like, you're supposed to care about these creatures because because you just do, because they're your kin. How can you not love a kestrel? How can you not love a wolf? I don't understand. And it's just completely the wrong direction to try to just keep monetizing it. So, and here you are, you say, it's, it's exactly it. Then when the economy collapses, it's worth zero because it's real value was never the thing that people understood. Oh, it's so but frustrating. What you're saying also relates to veganism and vegetarianism with capitalism because those two those two industries now, you can call them industries because when you look at what's happening in the I, I live in a very wide place, so I don't I don't see the big world and the big cities, but what I hear from the internet and the people I know who live in cities and and, and as you were saying, Hugh, when EXA were organizing their their demonstrations, they were organizing vegan meals, you know, I mean, yeah. all this now, all this is an industry that is highly polluted. It's based on soya and cereals, which is we know what that is doing. I mean, nobody is bringing up the fact Well, you are in your book a bit. I am clear, but is bringing up that that uh, the, these these movements are completely uh, part of capitalism. I mean, beside the Beside the scientific evidence of the biome and the, the, the need for humans to be omnivorous, as we know we are, um, it is a market. And it's, it's uh, really uh, depressing to, to, for me to see young people who think that they are really good doing something right and we're going to save the planet. And, we're gonna, and they're part of that religion um, of, of veganism and vegetarianism. And this, this is... And thank you very much for your book because that was a very, that was very good and very courageous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I paid the price, but yeah, it was worth it. <laughs> yeah. Have you uh, seen Corrie Morningstar and the, you know, the you know her and the yeah 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 absolutely manufacturing yep. for consent and um, what was the wrong kind of green? Wrong kind yeah. of green, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Uh, um, uh, that's a group of people, isn't it? It's not. Yeah, there's like four or five of them in her little in her little collection, and they do a great job just breaking down the, you know, how all this gets hooked up to funding. You know how they need money, and that you know you go down this path where you you think you're forming an organization that is going to do something good, but the moment you're dependent then on the funders, what can happen? You know, and where they end up just selling their souls. Um, even though they thought they were trying to do something good. And it's hard because I know people need to earn a living. Like I, I don't have a lot of great, I, I don't you know people, like I get how that happens to people. And it, like, we all need friends to pull us back. I mean, that's like really the only thing is like surround yourself with people who will be brutally honest. Like that's a step too far. It's your group is no longer going to be about what you want it to be about. If you sell out in that direction. Um, because that's what's happened to all the major environmental groups. I mean, we call it like big green because they were supposed to be about protecting the mountains and the rivers and the prairies and the creatures. And they've ended up just signing up for every form of destruction so that they can get advertising and funding. And it, it's very depressing because I'm sure those, some of those people still believe they're doing the right thing, but it just shows like where the human, where the human mind can go and how we can talk ourselves into stuff. Well, this brings me to think about what you wrote in your in the, the, the part of the book that you wrote in the Deep Green Resistance about activism. Mm -hmm. And you give a lot of very useful um, advice and tips and all sorts of, and I can see from experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we, we, we discuss this in our group quite a lot. And uh, we have, we have hmm, I think you would be better to discuss that than me. Because um, first is English is better than mine. <laughs> but um, 
No, but, uh, you know, I mean, I wanted to introduce the idea of the ARG in activism and see what Lear thinks of it. What do you think, you? Oh, sure, sure. Oh, but, but, I mean, first, the subject is, um, yeah, they're talking about truths and stuff. What about, you know, breaking stuff? I, I agree with you. <laughs> We've come to the time where the, you have to admit that these people are not going to stop. And I, I feel like, you know, there's too much discussion in in the green circles about ethics and stuff. And you say, well, that's all privilege. I mean, nobody nobody has these ethical discussions, of, you know, when Hitler's marching into Poland. It's, it's just uh, the fact that everybody's putting all these things like, you know, um, NVDA and, and making, you know, rule number one for Extinction Rebellion is, you know, we're a nonviolent organization. Well, you just said to everybody, you're an ineffective organization that can be ignored. And so I think uh, we're at the stage where we should, you know, get over ourselves and start uh, thinking more full spectrum. Um, how, how do you approach the subject? Well, I mean, I helped write a book about it, so I, I've done my best to broach the subject. Um, the first thing is I, it, I, I didn't investigate these ideas with any kind of joy. I mean, this is, it's rather grim, you know, when you have to start thinking about taking more serious action that could result in real harm to living beings that should never be undertaken lightly, that even to start imagining it, you, you have to be really careful, you know, like, because we've seen human history, like we know it's a pile of bodies and what people will do in the service of ideology. I mean, there's no question that we can just come unhinged in the service of whatever we think the greater good is. And it, it's, so I, I understand why people try to put absolutes in place to say, look, whatever we do, as long as we're not hurting any humans, it's probably okay. But we cross that line into violence, it, we can't do it because <clears throat> we'll lose it all. And I understand that because it does happen and it's happened over and over again to people who really did think they were doing the right thing. So I didn't undertake this with any joy at all. But <clears throat> having said that, I remember one of the first times I ever heard Derek speak, and this was before we were friends. And he said, look, my morality is about what is effective. It's not about how I feel. It's not about keeping my soul pure. I don't care about any of that. What I care about is whether the planet continues. And if a hundred years from now, you know, they've got clean air to, to breathe and some water to drink and maybe something to eat. That is what is most important. And I thought, well, he's right. That's a really great emotional you know, that, I mean, that moved me to, to think that, 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 you know, we need to shift a little bit, at least consider what might be necessary. And the problem with nonviolent direct action is that it, it relies on two things. And one is you need a lot of people. And number two, because you, you're not using weapons. So all you've got is your bodies. I mean, you can get a lot more done with a machine gun, but you know, there's a terrible price to be paid. So if you do it nonviolently, you're only using your bodies and you're the people more likely to get hurt. So you're, you're letting the harm fall to you rather than to others as a way of showing everybody how much you care about it. Um, so it, it has a kind of moral high ground there, which I, I very much appreciate. And I, I mean, I've been arrested six times doing civil disobedience, so I do understand the principles, but it also takes time because you can't build the numbers uh, without a lot of time. So you need to be doing these actions over and over showing people the nature of the system we live in because when you remain nonviolent and they come at you with violence it shows the invisible violence that's always there you know the, the reason we all conform is because they have the power and we don't and when you go up against that they will bring the violence and then that makes it really obvious to everybody this is the system that we live under and that yes they do have all the power and they will use violence and we're the good people we don't do that um, and you will immediately have more people who want to join you'll have public opinion on your side it's how the civil rights movement worked in the united states is over and over again very brave people put themselves in harm's way some of them were killed um, but they were willing to show that you know we're not going to hurt back they can hurt us as much as they want we are going to win and they did I mean, they changed all kinds of laws that we don't have segregation anymore. My whole life has been lived in a world without segregation. So it's, you know, it, it, it can be very extraordinary. They brought down all kinds of um, despotic governments around the world. So these can be very effective techniques. The problem is we don't have time. That's the issue. If we had a thousand years to do this, I'd be like, great, let's just get started. Um, and we don't have the numbers. If there were 10 million people tomorrow who were willing to put themselves between 
what is left of this planet and fossil fuel and say, let's do it. Let's just line up row by row. They'll have to go through us to get to that fossil fuel. They'll have to go through us to move those coal trains. They'll have to go through us to blow up that mountain. But we don't have millions of people. We just don't. We've got a lot of people who care and are very concerned. Do we have actual warriors on the front lines? No, we don't. And I think one of the reasons is that everybody is conflicted. They want this way of life to continue and they know in their hearts what it takes that we need industrial levels of energy because everyone is so damn addicted to their phones and their computers and their ice cream 24 seven and their cars and all the rest of it. Like it's made a really cushy way of life. Did it make us happy? No, half of the people who live in the United States, half have been on antidepressants. We're the loneliest, saddest people who have ever lived. Oh no, you, you're preaching to the choir here. It's nuts, so, right? So, <laughs> so, so, so this is why we wrote Deep Green Resistance. Like, let's at least think about these other tactics. What could be done if we were to take up yeah. asymmetrical warfare, essentially, if we were to take up guerrilla warfare against the system that we have identified as killing the planet? So yeah, I, I, what, what could we, do? we gonna, could do it. That's the thing. We could. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done a, a lot of, sorry. No, <laughs> I, it's I've, just like, they all say, oh, it doesn't work. It does work, in fact. That's no, not I can tell you it works. It. I, I mean, I, I grew up during the apartheid era, yeah. and I, I just can't, the bile comes up in my throat when I hear all this because, uh, all this pacifism, because it's, it, it, pacifism doesn't work. And, and so, I, you know, I've been doing a lot of kind of movement jacking for, Extinction Rebellion and trying to radicalize them on the Good. point. Um, and the, yeah, the uh, the rhetoric there is it's middle class, it's uh, it's privileged and it's completely unrealistic. Uh, you know, they're still looking for political solutions. And my comparison for South Africa is the ANC started in about 1902, somewhere around there. Uh, it took until 1994, so 94 years. So they on the night, so the people, you know, burning pink, and I mean, nicest people in the world, and you know, just starting out uh, with these new political parties, um, splintering off uh, extinction rebellion. They on a 94-year path. Now I did. Uh, I, I wanted to get them real. I mean, a lot of the reason why all these people will not uh, get over this rhetoric of saving civilization instead of saving the ecology right. is because they really don't uh, believe that there is a planetary crisis. They talk the house down, but in their heart of hearts, they don't. I did a poll on Extinction Rebellion on Reddit, uh, just a sample. And I said, you know, when, when do you think um, it will get to the point where protest is no longer necessary because we've just passed all the climate tipping points and we've past the point where where even a rebellion can do anything. Now, that was the gist of the question. There was a clear split in the movement. Is mm -hmm. the half the people thought that we had about five years left. So this was a year ago. So 2025. Now we've got yeah. four years. <laughs> Sorry. Now we've got four years. Okay. Now we've got four. Yeah. Uh, no, but I think psychologically it moves as a window it's five, years. five years yeah it's, it's like yeah. cold it's like fusion reactions you know they always oh, it's always coming there. it's always there yeah. we're about it's to a, have free energy forever yeah, yeah and, and this is it's every year is the last year where we have to you know the decider where <laughs> we have to do this something. is it this is it it's always this is it <laughs> it's a this is our final chance this year yeah okay and it's been that way for 10 years but but yeah so the um the the thing is that uh half the people clearly thought there wasn't a climate emergency at all there were all the 2100 i hate the year 2100 if i say the year 2100 i want to you know just chuck the computer out the window because i can read these articles with 2100 but the the that's the the one thing is they just don't fundamentally they haven't grasped that that you know that the, we're on the titanic and it really is gonna sink okay. it's not a movie Yes. Um, the, and the other thing is economics. The the thing that I think people miss terribly is uh, when they talk about MLK and when they talk about Gandhi and say, you've got to look at the economics. If you look at the struggle in South Africa, it's an economic struggle. It's got nothing really 
uh, to do with uh, race and the color of your skin, except that poor people happen to be a different color. But it, you're fundamentally missing the point if you're saying it's something to do with civil rights or it is something equitable. It's it's in the civil rights movement, you could say it's the exact opposite. Basically, there are lots of potential debt slaves that are not bankable by the banking system. So they can't wait to elevate black people, and that's what they did. And then it reached its apiosis in the subprime mortgage crisis. Right. That, that was that MLK got credit for people of color, and it got us all the way to the subprime mortgage crisis. Subprime is... Uh, a euphemism for black black mortgages, and and so 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 the banking system and the guys in control had a massive incentive, economic incentive to actually have civil rights. The same in in India, is there's you know they have this colonial rhetoric and stuff. Is actually Britain was going bankrupt, uh, trying to keep an empire together, and Mountbatten went out to to Britain with one mandate get out as quickly as possible without killing too many people in the process. That was his mandate. <laughs> and so then to say that Gandhi achieved liberation, no, Gandhi knew that he had to be passive because otherwise he might arouse this, these uh, colonial, you know, imperial juices and then he'd be in real trouble. So he was working hand in glove with yeah. Batten to get Britain out decently and quickly. Okay. Um, so it's got nothing to do, you know, if you look at the economic side, all these things like a civil rights thing are just just wrong. So if you take that and say, well, it's all about economics, then you say it's a battle to the death yeah. because it's, it's basically these people's lifestyle. I'm talking about the one percent is the aristocrats. They would rather die than stop being plutocrats. And so so people are not there yet. They, they don't realize that we, we they, the 1% will battle to the death. So we're in an all-out war. And if you say, once you get to that point and say, okay, this is an all-out war, then you say, well, okay, then you pick up Sun Chu and the art of war. Yeah. And Sun Chu never says, don't be violent. It's, it's all about, you try and do, you know, Wu Wei and not, uh, everything is practical. You, it winds up that you don't be violent because the, the cheapest way of winning the war is with the least expenditure and, and that turns out to be nonviolent. But that's not a principle in that you strive for in, um, in Sun Chu's Art of War. It's, it's Sun Chu is saying, like, it's, this is how you win. It just so happens that if you actually economic with your tactics, then it will be less violent. But I believe absolutely that you've got to say up front is, no, this you, you're going to take this lum chow, you know, like in Hong Kong, down to the mat. This is, I'm going down. This is, you look talking to a suicidal bastard who's going to yeah. take this into total war. And if you say that, the chances that you'll have to be violent get greatly reduced. I mean, at some stage, somebody's going to call you bluff and you're going to have to be violent. But that's the, the way to the least violence of all, is to come out really, really strong. And then you probably won't have to use it. Where we headed now with all this pacifism is you, somebody's going to get violent. The state's either going to get violent with the protesters or the protesters are going to get violent so that they can make headway. Uh, but that, that's how, how I see it. And here we are. We, we're not left with a lot of good choices. That's the thing. And it's not any of our fault. It, I mean, history has brought us here and now here we are. There have, there's never been people that have been staring at the end of the world. People have been staring at the end of their people. I mean, you know, there's been genocide after genocide and that's horrifying, but this is every living creature and this is where we are. So we're either going to stand and fight or we're going to decide that our moral purity is more is what we're after and we'll just let it go down. But I would hope we would at least consider some of these other tactics because um, it could be done. That was our conclusion at the end. I was like, well, we could do this. It's just, are we gonna? Well, so if you follow the same line of logic, then I think where we're, where we're at is it's not really a, a battle of material. You know, you, you don't just, you know, have added with uh, just by attrition, and whoever has the most resources wins. It's it's uh, psyops. It's uh, really if you what the essence of 
that comes out of like Sun Chu and Art of War or any military tactician will tell you that it's it's really all psyops. Uh, the only reason why armies go to uh, to to into a battle with each other is to resolve uncertainty. But if there's no uncertainty, then nobody would enter a battle. If if it's clear which side is going to win, you have to do asymmetric warfare or something like that. You can't go head to head with somebody when you know that you you know that's Goliath, you're David, uh, you know. So so uh, yeah. So so it's not necessary to to wage a war, but it is necessary to wage a psychological war and maybe an a, asymmetric war uh, at this stage, and. Yeah, the way what what we're doing um, is um, is really I don't want to say this word, otherwise it'll turn everybody off. But it's an alternate reality game. It's been known for a long time that um, you know psyops uh, have been done on the public for <laughs> since the First World War, and. It's a question of activists um, stepping up to the game that's been played on us uh, for, for a long time now. And the way to do that is with an alternate reality game with LARPing. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with all these terms. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know about LARPing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but it, it was, I mean, I've, I've, I can came to this conclusion in about 2012, and I've been working uh, towards that. And I was extremely jealous in, in, in January because um, the, I won't say the name because it's a keyword that might get me busted on YouTube, but the, the QN, <laughs> the, uh, the, you know, you know, the guys with the orange tyrant. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. They just pulled, they just pulled off a successful. Yeah. Uh, and so I think we, we should start um, doing that. Well, it's 1016 here, and I need, I have another one at 1030, so I'm going to have to go. All right. Yeah, thank you so, for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks for reaching out. I hope this was useful in some way. Happy to do it again because it's, it's been good for you. Here, so. well, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, would you? Yeah, I'll I'll get in contact with you, and we'll okay. we'll see. Yeah, definitely. Would we'd love to have you again? Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. We'll just be in touch. Take care, everyone. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right. Okay. Okay. So sure. I'll end the recording here, and then I, I think we'll start back again. At 10:30. Have you enough? Have you enough space on your Dropbox, Mike?